Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. I'm here to usher you into the week. It is the end of the Montana legislature. There's definitely a lot uh, happened, especially towards the end right there with the whole Zoe Suffer situation. Uh, one of the big things that are taken away is a $14 billion uh, package, uh, which includes a lot of tax reliefs for property owners in the state of Montana and also people who have paid income taxes who are also eligible for uh, tax rebates. Uh, started in August. So there, let me kind of give you the rundown. So uh, during the legislation session, this is uh, for, uh, for folks uh, who uh, own property and have also paid Montana taxes. So you don't, just because you don't own property in the state of Montana doesn't mean you're not entitled to some form of uh, payment for uh, tax relief. Um, so let's start off with HB 192, which is the uh, income tax relief. And this would be uh, roughly, if you've been a resident, uh, after paying the 2021 taxes, you, you're entitled to getting up to $1,200. And it could either be filed to you electronically or they'll send it in the mail. And so if you are married, it's $2,500. You know, it, you know, you've been a resident for entire tax year of 2021, beginning uh, January 1st, 2021. You filed a 2020 Montana resident or part year resident return. So those are the couple little intricacies. You can find out more information through the MontanaRevenue.gov website. Um, one of the other things is the property tax rebate. And this was a more of like a rebate up to $500 a year of property taxes on principal residents paid for 2022 and 2023. The actual amount of property tax you paid for the principal Montana residents or just a flat rate of the $500. And then, yeah, I mean, so you've owned or lived in Montana property as your principal residence for at least seven months of each year and were assessed and paid property taxes on the residents on this uh, relevant uh, tax year. So those are some of the qualifications beyond that. Uh, this was the 68th uh, session as well. This was a supermajority in which a lot of Republicans in the GOP got a lot of uh, things moving forward. Uh, some Democrats were very concerned about uh, their voices uh, not being able to be heard. Um, Zoe Zephyr, for instance, was one that um, in which they basically barred her from being on the floor, but still being eligible to uh, have her vote in the Senate, uh, I, I mean, in the House as well. So. <clears throat> So um, House Bill number two, which was the main budget vehicle and the prerequisite for session closure. This was like basically their, their big budget. Uh, basically, uh, this is from uh, the Flathead Beacon. Um, the primary issue is that the House and Senate have ultimately voted on the same version of the bill. If the House amended a Senate bill on the floor after the Senate adjourned for the session, the bill would go would essentially be dead. Moreover, lawmakers have spent much of the past several days in conference committees where delegations from each chamber reconcile different versions of the bill. The Senate adjourned before it voted to concur of this many uh, of the bills, which include House Bill 8. 16 is a must pass end game bill for the GOP to provide property income tax rebates as well as a broad array of other expenditures. So this is a lot of different things happening as well. And uh, Gianforte has been wary about signing some changes unless some amendments were made to uh, Senate Bill 4, House Bill 29, and House Bill 37. So we'll talk a little bit more about the legislation session during the City Council report in which we'll have Jessica Miller talk, give us a brief update on some of those stuff, even though a lot of that stuff is kind of passe uh, just because it was from Monday's meeting and the session basically wrapped up um, uh, basically went into adjournment so let's see what are some of the more news items that are happening as well um, you know like we're going back to uh, uh, Zoe Zephyr because uh, she has officially filed a lawsuit in conjunction with the ACLU of Montana and residents of Montana House District 100 are seeking to challenge the disciplinary actions taken against state representative Zoe Zephyr Democrat from Missoula by the House uh, Montana House of Representatives. From the very beginning, many of her colleagues refused to call her by her name and referred to her pre-transitional name and gender, hence the uh, concept of dead naming somebody. And so far, she tried to get a chance to speak. And when it finally came, she was thrown under the bus and told to apologize for a law that would prevent uh, gender affirming care. Uh, my personal feelings on this have been pretty clear. Taking away someone's choice to do whatever they want as long as they're not hurting anyone else should not be uh, persecuted based on their choices to change their appearance. Anyways, the legislature decided to punish uh, Zoe as protests erupted in the House chambers with Let Her Speak being chanted. She was voted uh, in the 100th District of Missoula to represent 11,000 people who believe in her voice is important in the Senate 
in the state's practice in drafting uh, laws from bills. So Zephyr is allowed to participate, like I said, uh, but it would be remotely. And you know, what a crazy way for Montana into legis legislative session. So, and many other states as well that are also doing gender affirming um, bills. This is uh, part of uh, a part of these other states is Tennessee and Kansas have also voted to pass few weeks to narrowly define who is female and who is male in a state law on top of what Montana is doing to define genders. Um, but on a more lighter note, uh, Huckleberry season is up, uh, I mean, it was not much of a segue, it's just kind of move on. Um, Huckleberry season is upon us and the House legislation passed HB 180, which would effectively make the fruit at the state fruit, it is one of the uh, few plants that cannot be bargained with, it cannot be cultivated, and especially that can, cannot be grown domestically. However, this fruit has become a mainstay in Montana and a draw for people during the farmer's market in the downtown Missoula. And speaking of which, this weekend is the first official farmer's market as it's getting a little bit balmy and stormy outside. It's still a little bit warm this morning, but it's going to start cooling off this weekend. Um, we're going to see some uh, higher, t uh, lower temperatures with highs into the 50s, but we're going to see start seeing some nicer temperatures going into next weekend so uh, look forward to that so this you know this is always kind of like the first start of the farmers market they always have a lot of great stuff uh, a lot of starter uh, plants for people who want to plant their own gardens um, so it's a good uh, 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 a way for people to get out of hibernation officially in the city of Missoula just go downtown hang out and do all that kind of stuff um, Smurf for Stone will be getting the ball rolling again with the EPA and so far many suggestions by locals have been dismissed in terms of the frequency of testing. The story was for a Laura Lundquist from Missoula Current. Over some time, the EPA stopped testing on the site. Funding was cut under the Trump administration, and as of now, they're working the, uh, on best practices. As, and while Montana Department of Environmental Quality wants to do their part, the EPA could only offer two testing sessions a year, and any other testing could be undermine the results, according to EPA representative. Uh, it was weird, kind of, kind of high my way or the highway kind of stance, but there's no uh, meeting schedule for the future. So as of right now, it's there, the ball is rolling, but it's just not one of those things that when Smurfits don't close in the first place, and then a couple years later, they were actually having more frequent meetings over at the Frenchtown uh, High School quasi library kind of deal, and they were talking to me about it frequently. MCAT was filming it, um, and then just kind of stopped. So that was kind of how it's happening going right there as well. So let's go into more national news. Uh, the the U U.S. Mexico border is getting a little bit tighter. This is also on the heels that the all those uh, pr uh, restrictions uh, for the pandemic will start ending next Thursday, which is going to be, uh, I believe, it's May 10th. No, May 11th. Sorry, I probably should look at my notes, but the long-running pandemic excuse will allow the flow and rights uh, channels for migrants to get into the U.S. will be open again. Um, even with the restrictions, the administration has seen record numbers of people crossing the border, and President Joe Biden has responded by cracking down on those who cross illegally, by creating new avenues meant to as alternatives to a dangerous and often deadly journey. This is an additional 1,500 troops on top of the already 2,500 troops that are already on the border recently will start clamping down on the illegal crossing it's, which includes uh, Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, Venezuelans who cross illegally will automatic, automatically be turned away. Overall, the U.S. will start allowing up to 30,000 people in America every month. Those countries and Mexico uh, will let them work legally and get access to help as long as they took the legal channels. You know, it's never perfect, but it's an olive branch and the, uh, to a surge the U.S. is getting ready for next Thursday. So that's kind of what's happening there. Um, up next, we got a nice teaser for you guys. This is from uh, Lowell School. They visited uh, the Muzo Public Library last couple months. They got a little taste of all the other partners uh, under one roof, and this is the compilation of all the stop animation those kids have done here in this very room. So without further ado, here is Lowell School kids doing their stop animation.
Hey guys, welcome back. Um, let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. If you haven't already seen them already last night, this movie is going to uh, basically uh, uh, destroy the box office. And that's pretty much about it because the you know most of these movies are just like Marvel. Hmm, ooh, space. Ooh, it's Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, I like the other ones. Well, I'm going to go, go see this one. So basically, this will wrap up the trilogy that is Guardians of the Galaxy. But who knows? You know, the whole pur purpose of this is was uh, basically uh, James Gunn's last crossover with Disney after he got canceled. But then he came back. And then, ba like... After this, he, like DC was just like, hey, why don't you direct for us? Is like, hey, this really worked out. Why don't you actually run our own entire studio just based on one successful film? That is going to work out. Enjoy a series of tropes from a director as he shows you the craziest set pieces while special effects and art designers stop living their life and making this crazy person's movie possible. Rejoin the Guardians as they try to deal with bringing back a dead character and try to gloss over the whole mess this MCU brings on every property and solve the mysteries of Rocket Raccoon because Jem Gunn really liked to make his uh, little brother wear the, uh, the green uh, leotard suit and jump uh, around like some kind of trash panda. High Evolutionary is the main villain of this guy because it's all about evolving and creating a perfect society, but you gotta crack a few eggs to do so, and the, one of the eggs that they cracked was the wrong egg. Now it's time for revenge, or something like that. Uh, this next movie is a movie that you probably will not see or even remember after I tell you about it. It's called Love Again. So have you ever uh, um, had somebody you loved uh, basically uh, uh, lose their number? and then you texted somebody and then they pretended to be that person. Basically, that's kind of what this is, but it's a little bit more romantic. So imagine like, uh, uh, you know, you, you, so, okay, let me refer to my notes. So, have you ever been so delusionally in love that you text a number that once belonged to your ex in hopes they might respond? Well, this movie is about a dead boyfriend and a woman's attempt to foist her feelings onto a guy who got her dead ex's number. Watch as they fall in love and have her projected feelings rewarded because no one likes to build relationships anymore. Uh, they just try to like to jump right into them. Uh, I'm sure this guy's like perfect and seems like there's nothing wrong with a hot girl texting him. And that's the movie. Uh, this other one is basically, what's love got to do with it? So while you're going to see dumb, not Star Wars movie, have, a, have another option for your spouse to miss the dumb space movie and watch another uh, love romance movie, where this, where, this should probably, should probably should, these, these probably should have came out in February, just saying. But basically, watch a British gal uh, manifest destiny her way between a guy that she likes with an arranged marriage. They're not Hindu, they're, um, <laughs> They're Pakistani, excuse me. Enjoy a familiar trope of traditional family ties about uh, getting stronger only for a selfish, entitled woman stealing a man from his duties uh, like an arranged marriage. Just kidding. It's a, another fun, dumb love movie that goes against the odds of traditional marriage. And, you know, love marriage. That's, that's great, right? Uh, <laughs> all right, so up next we got a... a, a Basically, uh, we have a, a brand new dub and stuff for you guys, but it's definitely one of those uh, 1950s equivalent of after school specials. This is from the 1955 movie, Boy with a Knife. Hey guys. 
Hey, jerk, I need a soda, jerk. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a soda jerk. Huh. Yeah. Well, well, well. You smell that? Mmm, <laughs> yep. A cringy adult. <laughs> yeah. I was once a kid. All right, fellas, let's go play craps or some other legal stuff. And I got the D20 right uh, say here. Say, boys, uh, you like uh, cards? Well, I think that's a bit old-fashioned for us. Come on, guys. I've been on fire the last couple days. A one, a two, a scooby doo Oh, yeah, 20. Well, I know what I'm not wanted. Well, I thought he would have heard that a long time ago. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's casually stealing. Brr, hey, that's my livelihood. What are you talking about, old man? This is mine. You, you... Huh, this is a fine product. Shame if anything can happen to it. You kids are so entitled these <laughs> days. Calm down, Just because old man. you think you're all that doesn't mean oh, you can do get call the police. Chips. Oh, I'm gonna call the police on you. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> There's no need to escalate things. I'm not falling for your handsome stare. Well, how about some handsome logic? Well, what is this handsome logic you speak of? Listen, these boys are at a very vulnerable age in this particular time. See? I think this will cover it. Uh, okay, that's okay. You boys should what? stop by the Christian Center. It's pretty lit. I honestly thought he was going to huh. sip on the chips. I can't believe he did that. That's weird. Do I have to go there? Don't you do it. Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> and you still mess. Oh, uh, you bony. That was my ball. I was playing catch with the handsome man. Here we hey, go again. give that back. <laughs> That's mine. Yeah, no, just keep it away. I want that. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, there you go. I can easily oh, get it back, but I'm just—I'm humoring you. Hey, buddy, think fast. <laughs> gotcha. What you gonna do about it? I'm gonna beat you. Up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, here you go. Oh. Oh, didn't expect oh, me no. to be. Uh, he's all just wrestling. Oh, oh no, he's oh, squirrely. Yeah. All American wrestling. Oh. Oh yeah. What do you think about this? Huh? Uh, I should probably do something. All right, boys. You better relax with that thing. Do you even know how to use that? I'm trying to destroy my lungs, please? It's a knife. It's not that difficult, What's but still. What's going on over there? You better put that knife away. You're going to get yourself in big trouble. I'll cover for you guys again. And, um, hey, listen. It's no big deal that you have a knife, but just use it for good, not evil. I'm Uncle Ben. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, don't worry about them. Are you sure? Because I'm really worried about them. Like, they're bad people. They're bad kids. They're not all that bad. I'm working with them. Work harder. Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for your city council report where I talk a little bit about what's going on with the city of Missoula. Uh, but before I kind of get started, I kind of want to skip ahead to a proposal in which they're trying to talk a little bit more about the Fort Missoula hospital that was basically bought up by a private owner. Um, generally, um, this was a uh, you know, this is part of the historic preservation in which staff basically denied any moving forward with anything that they wanted to do. They also wanted to, uh, on top of that, they also wanted to uh, ask if they could uh, demolish an old garage that was built there not so long ago as well, and which was also denied. So there was a lot of, uh, there wasn't much uh, that uh, the developers could do for the uh, Missoula, uh, Fort Missoula uh, former hospital. Um, so that w didn't necessarily move forward. Especially when you uh, j when we jump right into the first couple comments, which they did talk a little bit more about um, the Fort Missoula as well. Um, but this one is actually uh, Kathy Paradozzi, and uh, she talks about more than just the Fort Missoula, just about this basically the state of Missoula in her own opinion. Last year, the city invested over twelve million dollars into Mullen Road build project. This will allow developers to build 3,000 more houses in Missoula for nearly 7,000 people. This means 14,000 more cars using our already crowded streets and sewer systems. And think about the school districts. They're very crowded right now. I know for a fact that several of them cannot take any more students. So now we... Um, using our streets. Now we are going to invest over $30 million into South Avenue West of Reserve Street and a short section of Higgins Avenue. At the same time, 
We have two failing footbridges. Orange Street underpass is failing, and many of our streets have so many potholes, they're half <coughs> dirt. And as you know, when you drive around, it's dangerous. You could rip your tire right off. Brook Street is being milled and repaved again after 15 years by city crews that did it before. Now it is failing because they never finished the clay potholes. They were not dug out correctly. Okay, so this is quoted from Jeremy Keynes, the Summer News, right here. Nice little newspaper, by the way. Summer News, letter. We are replacing some water mains, including some pipe that was installed in the early 1900s. That's a long time ago, you guys. We are also reinvesting in leak prevention, flood protection, and water quality protection. So at the same time, City engineering has totally ignored Fort Missoula and its early 1900 sewer and water system. Engineering knew about this two years ago. So did the manager of the sewer plant, you know, we are all appalled by the fact that our most trusted engineering firm, WGM and DVG Architects and North of the border, LLC developers based in Denver out of our state would want to install 30 high-end condos and commercial strip malls at our open space at our beautiful historic Fort Missoula. Okay, and so those are the many concerns, you know, that, that's, that's basically a lot to unpack uh, from what she was mentioning as well. A lot of those, in, uh, you know, problems are in the purview of the city council, but when it comes to moving things forward, it's all about money. So, you know, you want to fix the roads, you got to pay the money. There is money that is set aside for these road constructions and just to kind of like answer even some of the questions for even some of you who might have some concerns out there as well. Is like there's a chip and seal project in which, you know, if you want to report a pothole, you report a pothole. You don't have a city staff member who gets paid to drive around the city of Missoula to make so, sure the roads are good. You have people, it's all complaint driven. So the government is a sense of like where the people have to tell their constituents, their representatives like, hey, this is what's going on here. Do something about it. You know, but at the same time, it's mostly like you're relying on somebody else to do the work for you. And then it gets frustrating when nothing gets done. And so I can understand that there's a definitely catch 22. And then, of course, you got to understand also Fort Missoula is one of those most underdeveloped sites in the in, in Missoula because it doesn't have residential. It's always been just a lot of just put, like quasi park residential, uh, not even like not residential. It's basically just it's a public park. It's uh, it's public use, public utility. And one of the things is that like it's not doesn't really have like a tax base. And, and if they try to get anyone else to, you know, pay those kind of taxes, they were just like, yeah, we don't want to do this. We can't just have a section of people paying the property taxes when not many people actually own property on the Fort Missoula. So how could you replace and do these kind of water mains and kind of things without the potential of being able to pay for it? Because the water system in place can barely even pay for itself. And not to mention, you know, uh, when she was talking about the mill and build project, that was a uh, grant of $13 million which is a federal grant that used to help build infrastructure in the particular area. So there's not necessarily, uh, not, there's, there's a lot of interesting development going on in the city of Missoula. And at the same time, um, you know, like there is just constant development. And so like her, she was made a slide against like the fact that they're Denver based, you know, like there's a lot of places that are based in many different locations. Um, heck, even like the architecture between the mercantile, got some flack just because they're from Bozeman. So it's the same state, but it's not the same town. So it's weird. It's like, we want to like do local stuff, but there's only certain limitations that locals can even do in the first place. So sorry, there's a lot to unpack right there. Cause you know, you gotta, you, you, if you want progress, you gotta actually move forward. You gotta spend money and you gotta do that kind of stuff. And a lot of people are feeling the crunch of that as well. So Benjamin Spencer talks about the Fort Missoula hospital in this next quote right here, a uh, little bit more details on that. The first group isn't happy about the project. They don't want to develop the fort, but they feel like if that's what it takes to um, restore that building for the community, then they'll accept it. And the other group is sad to see the building in such disrepair, but building a small five acre neighborhood with a couple of commercial buildings in the fort is just off the table. So we need to find another way to do that. And then with a short break for a TV interview, uh, Maxwell was nice enough to talk with me. 
when we talked for a while, he seems like an all right guy. But what I took away from that conversation is while the history of that building is ours, the building itself belongs to him. And rather than restore our historic military hospital, they're going to turn it into a modern office building. And I asked him how that would benefit me as a member of this community. And he told me that they would probably put a pub in the basement. So this, pro this proposal is not about preservation. It's about exploitation. When we go to the fort, we see beauty and serenity. And they see prime river riverfront property, you know, the three story existing structure okay and so you know um you know there are many people who are very concerned about this uh potentially being in uh, a can of worms that could potentially open ben sees the fort as a community space you need to uh, uh that you never need a reservation for and hopes that they want to keep the building but not should move forward a project that would turn this public space into a commercial nightmare so um, that's kind of happening there. And then in our last public comment, uh, this one n doesn't necessarily have to do too much with like the city issues or anything like that, but just a, a nice reflection to kind of throw back to uh, Emmett, the elderly punk rocker that used to uh, grace our televisions on MCAT as well. So here he is talking about the, uh, uh, the lack of uh, yellow cab services in the city of Missoula. Dependent on yellow taxi cab service for so many years since I moved here in 1986. I'm grateful to the city council for providing free bus service that has helped me in more ways than you can know. But the yellow cab, and I know you don't deal with cab service, but every major town like Missoula has cab service and we've doubled in size since 1986. Yellow cab has saved my life many times. It saved me when I had to go to the hospital because of um, a horrible allergy attack to, you know, some foods that I eat eaten at 3 a.m. in the morning. And it has um, provided me with good doctor's appointments. I do not have an Android phone, therefore I cannot call Uber or any of the other services, you know, such as that. I just don't have one of those phones. For me as a low-income person, I've relied on it even to get to the Missoula Science Fiction Convention, MISCON. And ironically, um, it has even helped me, I hate to confess this, it's helped me get a free ride home from the bar here, Thomas Mar Bar, when I've had too much to drink. Okay, so th th there's a little uh, thing with that. The city also gave them a number for another uh, service as well. And that, that just kind of uh, kind of goes into the idea that not that many people, there's, that, there's the tech divide. Um, and then, you know, some people who don't have access to their own vehicles or probably shouldn't be driving and want to be responsible and be able to do, uh, uh, take a cab, do the kind of ride share kind of deal. But, you know, when you don't have the technology or an app on your phone, heck, if your phone dies, how can you get a ride home? Um, like, you know, you'd call the bar. I don't know if there's like, and this was on the heels of the fact that a couple of the uh, tax services in Missoula kind of closed. It was a very simple call them and be like, hey, there's somebody here who needs a ride. And then you basically get picked up by the cab. They sometimes walk into the bar and they ask for that. Not that I would know anything about that. So uh, yeah, so that's information right there. It's interesting how like Missoula is changing, but as we're modernizing, we we have to like think about some of those old uh, systems in place that you were used to help people like Emmett get home safely. So Jessica Miller is back to talk about the legislation session, legislative session. And this is uh, just to kind of reflect um, of the, some of the bills that they were talking about and some of the purview that is going to affect uh, the city of Missoula. So here's the first one by Jessica Miller. Will be legislative day 90. Uh, we had heard last week there were some rumors they were going to try to finish by this Wednesday. Um, I, it sounds like they've kind of backed off from that and they probably will run through Friday. But that is the, the absolute deadline on the very last day. Um, so let's see, we didn't miss or we didn't meet last week, so I do have a fair number of updates tonight. House Bill 774 generally revised election laws, which would have moved our elections to even numbered years. That bill was tabled. Senate Bill 523 generally revised tax increment financing laws was also tabled. House Bill 925 uh, revised laws related to tax increment um, pledged payment of bonds. That one failed its second reading on the floor. 
House Bill 971, I'm not sure I've actually brought that one up before to this body. Um, it was introduced late. The legislature had to suspend the rules in order to take it up late, right, late. Um, and they had secured the votes in place to, to do that ahead of time. So that bill has flown through and is currently um, sent to enrolling. That is one that would... Uh, take some some carbon emission analysis out of the Montana Environmental Policy Act. Um, we did have a chance to testify on it, but again, the, the votes were there before they made the introduction of the bill. Okay. So, you know, like, you know, uh, that was one of the bigger bills that were passed as well, is that, you know, the concept of carbon emissions isn't, isn't something that you could initially see and so that's why they pretty much decided to be like, oh, if you can't really see carbon emissions, do they really affect the climate? And so that was part of the uh, legislature kind of moving that uh, forward to basically try to take that out of the, um, the, the wording when it comes to that. You know, it's been a rough legislation session uh, overall because for so many years there have been uh, checks and balances in the House and Senate, but the supermajority created an opportunity. Uh, and if it wasn't for the few GOP members crossing the aisle and questioning some of the bills that seemed more harmful uh, than good uh, that could have passed. Um, however, it kind of seemed like this whole clean and livable climate seems to fall on deaf ears in the Montana leadership, which is part of our constitution. Um, I would not blame them because it all started with many industries leaving Montana, creating a vacuum of tax base that is just no longer here. Um, you know, Missoula is still feeling the effects of Smurfit Stone closure, but with the, their closure, they left a super fun site that will not go anywhere until 2028, according to the EPA, which is uh, considered uh, the Clark Fork as a five out of the top 10 endangered rivers in accordance with clean water regulation. So back to the legislation report. This is uh, uh, Jessica Miller talking a little bit more about uh, the session. House Bill 819, creating the Montana Community Reinvestment Act to fund workforce housing, and House Bill 816, revised distribution of surplus revenue. Both of those had conference committees this afternoon, and so I'm not really sure how those are going to turn out. They've both been kind of heavily amended back and forth the last couple of weeks, or the last um, few days, actually, and so it's, it's hard to speak to what is in those and whether or not we still support them. So they're both in conference committee and I'll be keeping an eye on the language that comes out of those committees um, in the next couple of days. House Bill 465, um, revised local government acceptable uses of building permit fees, which allows us to have a little larger um, carryover in our building fund and also um, pay for all of the things that actually support our, our building permits and inspections. That one has actually been signed into law. So we're very excited about that one. Senate Bill 382, create the Montana Land Use Planning Act. That one has passed both chambers and been sent to enrolling. And so it is going through the signature process now. And so it needs to be signed by um, the, the Speaker of the House, Senate, uh, President of the Senate, and then it will be sent to Governor Gianforte for his signature. And we're in the same place on Senate Bill 374, which is our revised local government public document retention. Um, that one has passed both chambers and is also in the signature process. And that's our um, records retention bill that I know Marty put in a lot of work on. And so we're we're glad to see the, the nice open road there and, and ready for the signature process. And that is my update for tonight. And as I said, I'll be bringing um, a longer report to Committee of the Whole um, as soon as I can get all the stuff downloaded and organized properly. Okay. And so we'll have a full report for you next Friday as well. We'll probably show pieces of that report from Jessica Miller the, uh, from the Office of the Mayor. Um, she'll reflect on the legislative session, what has passed, what has failed. Um, yeah, just all the bills that are going to the, the desk of uh, Governor Dr Greg Gianforte. Um, uh, speaking of the session as well, um, at the end there's always comments by City Council, and one of them was to do with uh, the, the Zoe Suffer uh, situation in the legislature. So this is uh, Mike Nugent talking a little bit more about this. Democracy, and we talk about the freedom and exchange of ideas and listening to people that don't agree with us. And, um, you know, this only works if we listen respectfully to people that don't agree with us. And we should all be outraged at, at that beyond what we're actually talking about in this um in this whole conversation and it it just highlights and, and the the story you shared uh, this evening just highlight how this conversation belongs almost anywhere 
but Helena. It belongs almost anywhere but uh, legislative boardrooms around the country. I mean, it belongs with families. It belongs with individuals. And for anybody to make it seem like this is such a simple thing when it's not, it's the farthest thing from it. And we need to give people the space and the respect to to do what is right for them. And, um, you know, I was proud to be uh, part of the group that signed on to that letter. I've been proud of what uh, many of you have done and, and statements you've made and um, things you've participated in. And I was proud to be Missoulian on Friday night. And I think that those, uh, those moments are so important, especially for the role that Missoula plays in this state. It's being a, being a leader in, issues that maybe the state as a whole isn't quite ready to handle. And the message that I think it sent was you have a place here and you have people that love you here. And um, I think that we can all be proud to be Missoulians. Yep. And also on top of that, Zoe Zephyr represents 11,000 Missoulians. And so not uh, by uh, basically stipling her voice, they're stipling 11,000 of people that they uh, that she represents. So thinking about it like that. So a lot of times if we always think about our politicians as just one person and what you see is what you get, but they are also big representatives of the people. And hopefully this could move forward um, in terms of uh, how the lawsuit's gonna go just to basically have their uh, Day in, day in court, essentially. So yeah, that's it for your uh, regular city council. We're gonna jump into committee meetings. So let's talk about some land use and planning. So this is a big thing that they're talking about how they're gonna like curve parking, while at the same time talking about a new code, uh, talk about certain scenarios. Aaron Wilson, infrastructure mobility planning, talking about these new code um, and talking about some of the scenarios. And this is what Aaron Wilson had to say. That on residential, it's a lot harder to decide to live car free than it is to make individual trips without a vehicle. So the example is maybe you need a vehicle for your job, but you can go to the grocery store uh, for other services. Or maybe you can get to work without a vehicle, but you need that vehicle for other types of activities. So that equity needs to look at more than just what's the access around, but also um you know, resi the difference between residential parking requirements versus commercial parking requirements, there's a difference there. Um, and I thought that was an interesting point that came up and just something for us to consider as we're going through these decision points. Uh, All right, so that's uh, Aaron Wilson on that. And, you know, they're, 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 one of the big code reforms is that they're deciding whether or not when they're building more residential and apartment complexes is what they can do to help curve the amount of parking, amount of cars that are going to be impacting it. And so, you know, so far it's kind of been a lot of back and forth. There's just not much to really kind of talk about it in terms of like accommodate capacity if they include parking. And with some of the new languages in place, if they don't have to buy any parking at all for the residential, these residential sites, they also don't, they can also bypass any ADA required handicap spots since they don't provide uh, traditional parking spots anyway. So uh, Mountain Line is another uh, uh, um, trying to provide parking for those to using the bus. So they're, they're another uh, big uh, used to uh, proponent in trying to change the code reform, maybe providing the parking near and around the sites in which they would have mountain line bus stops, pick people up, you can take them where they need to go rather than having to pay for parking in the downtown area. Maybe there's some kind of like parking scenario. So Daniel Carlino city council talks about the code, um, that this code could make a better community. And this is what he had to say. This falls under all three of the city's strategic lenses, um, climate, equity, and most of all, housing. Um, this is an important thing to do, to not turn all of our land into concrete and to be able to build denser as a community. Uh, it's an important thing to do if you want to be able to have walkable stores like number one Euro, you couldn't build that nowadays with parking mandates or like uh, Masala or Wardens. Um, if those weren't downtown, you wouldn't be able to build those corner stores around town with our current parking mandates. So it's good for climate to also help create more walkable neighborhoods. Um, and, uh, but most of all, um, this is important for us to take on now um, for housing rather than waiting a few years. Um, and I, I know this is something that our code reform consultants, I'm sure, are going to take on regardless in the bigger project. But it's important that we take it on early because, um, because we just cannot prevent housing from being built right now unnecessarily to prioritize concrete instead. Um, so I just ask us all to, um, to have a good discussion and to... Um, and to um, keep talking about this. 
All right, so towards the end of the meeting, there's a lot of back and forth. I um, mean, you know, they, they said that they needed to uh, get this thing kind of uh, wrapped at some point uh, in terms of uh, updating the code, but in the end, they turned out to be like, oh, let's going to continue this um, as they uh, go into further committee meetings to talk more about this as well. Um, another uh, uh, blurb I want to kind of talk about before I wrap up as well is the uh, public works. They spoke about uh, uh, the Orange Street underpass, which has been in the works uh, since 2021, and now they're actually putting a more than $350,000 on this project that connects downtown with the highway and north side neighborhoods. You know, it's that underpass that kind of goes underneath the railroad tracks to the north side. Uh, that was one of the things that they're trying to uh, do to help fund the repair of this particular site. And not to mention, you know, it's a, it's a tunnel. It's one of the few uh, ways to get to the other side of the tracks. Um, and so this is uh, we, you know, one of the things that they're moving forward on. And also Public Works talks about the uh, updated information in terms of, uh, you know, the poplar farm, which was being used by the wastewater treatment plant to help filter out the nitrate in the water to basically uh, have a, uh, its own kind of built-in water filtration system that is naturally based. And so this is a one th thing that they've been doing for the last, uh, it feels like they've been doing about 12, 13 years now. Uh, it feels like longer, but this is a, a project that includes about $100,000 a year to uh, keep this project going. And one of the things they were going to talk about, I don't have any clips for you to show you guys for this particular meeting, but they were talking about uh, basically changing from poplar trees to alfalfa. And one of the main reasons behind this is that they had a company that was going to buy all their poplar uh, hybrid wood, uh, but that company no longer exists. And so all their hopes were based on the potential sale of this to kind of recoup a lot of the costs. But now they're going to have to figure out other avenues and probably have to sell a lot of their wood much cheaper as a result. So yeah, so that's kind of what's happening in your city council. There's probably a lot more I've definitely glossed over. And if you want to learn more information, go to ci.missoula.mt.us. Again, you can always Google City of Missoula, and it should be the first link at the very top, and you should be able to get all access to these meetings and more. Uh, up next, we have a video to show you guys. It is from the Last Best Constitution and how they talk about Montana's Constitution dealt with education and the terms and of equalization. Now, does that sound familiar? Uh, state more state funding for the for education rather than local tax base, um, and so the idea was you kind of you would create a system where you pull tax money into the state and then it would distribute it back redistribute it to the districts in in a more equal way. So uh, we call that what equalization? Yeah, school equalization exactly. funding. Exactly. You know, there's a lot of statutory stuff on that every year. Yep. The every other year when the legislature meets. Yeah. They have to grapple with uh, with the way that's done, right? But essentially, it's constitutionally pretty much required, yeah, because uh, of the disparities, right? Exactly. So, uh, if somebody's got a huge taxes, you take mm -hmm. some of that, right? The, say the certain percentage of the mills, right? And you capture them from every community in the state, right. put them into a pot, then you just and send them back out. And if you're from a poor area, you get a little of that money from Coal Strip. Yeah. To help elevate the exactly. your, your ability to do education right. uh, locally. Right. Yeah. All right. And so there's a little taste of the last constitution. It is available online free on our MCAT YouTube page, um, MCAT TV Missoula. It's a great uh, resource for you to know a little bit more about our Montana Constitution while they uh, interview people who were actually there during the drafting of this uh, 50 years ago and some experts too who have studied this uh, extensively over the years. So um, uh, one of the bigger takeaways from that particular the last constitution is the fact that many of the soldiers from a post-World War II era be really benefited from the GI Bill which basically ha put a lot of people in college um, that allow them to get this kind of education in which they would create a constitution that pretty much was very literally amended. Probably amend, Montana's constitution was amended like three times in 50 years, which is kind of crazy if you really think about it. But, you know, that's the thing about constitutions is that, you know, it's supposed to be uh, what the state reflects and also the potential uh, pitfalls that may occur in the future to help prevent some of those things from happening. So. 
you guys should check it out. It's really interesting stuff, and it's definitely uh, and it's also available at the uh, Helena Civic TV as well. So, all right, so let's talk about some art. You know, it's it is Friday. It's the first Friday of May. This is literally like probably like the best uh, first Friday that they usually do. It's kind of like the end of the school year. Things are ch kind of chilling out a little bit. People have a little bit more freedom, getting a little bit warmer. Um, yeah, so this is definitely one of the bigger ones as we're going into the year and kicking things off is Turin, a Last Gun. So join MAM in celebrating the opening of Last Gun, Future Cosmic Energy, the first solo exhibit by the artist's work in Montana through geometric ab ab abstraction. Taryn Last Gun um, contributes to an ongoing indigenous narrative exploring the various relationships between color, shape, and nature and sky. Son of a, no a notable painter, Terrence Gudepi, Last Gun comes from a long uh, visual tradition. My work bridges the ancient and contemporary. I'm creating a new uh, Picani art form that is bold, vivid, even humorous at times and has minimalist and ge geometric qualities that are potent in meaning, content, and place. In the artist talk with Taryn, Last Gun is going to be featured on Saturday at 11 a.m. if you guys want to uh, speak to them personally. Uh, they got um, Patty Canyon Lady uh, up next. Then we got our next one. This is going to be at Patty Canyon Lady Salon. They're doing an exhibit at the uh, Burnswick Gallery featuring works by Patty Canyon Ladies Salon. This is a twice a month event that brings artists to work on their crafts and this show is all about their labors over various times. It'll be featured at the Burnswick Gallery here in the downtown Missoula area. Then we got The Quiet Painter, the artist shop featuring new works of oil by Keith Vanderpool. The show runs the month of May. The bio was from 2020 MAM Auction. Uh, this, uh, this bio, actually, that I'm reading about to read to you is from the, their, their 2020 MAM Auction. And after serving in Vietnam, Van de Poel received a BFA from the University of Iowa, Iowa City, following MA, a Master's in uh, Painting from Iowa State University, Ames. He, only, uh, he owned an art gallery and custom framing business in Ames for 35 years, retiring and moving to Montana in 2015. He has exhibited locally in the Radius Gallery, The Loft, and the Arts of Missoula Last Place Solstice. His works include included in museums, universities, and private collections interla internationally. And this is going to be featured at the Artist Shop. Then we got uh, Wild Wildfire Ceramic Studio is featuring a thing called My Body is My House is a depiction of two artists' interpretations of what it feels like to find a home in your body, whether it be a comfort or discomfort. This shows an uh, homage to feeling vulnerable, playful, dysphoric, and euphoric in your body. Our, their works uh, invite viewers to take on the consideration their body in the space and other spaces they occupy. Annalise Cole Weiss is the ceramicist living in and working in Missoula, Montana. Annalise holds a, a bachelor in Colorado State University and conducted their first baccalaureate study in the University of Montana. Um, let's see, uh, Tessa Hoeing is a ceramic sculpture and an um, illustrator dedicated to creating objects that feel abundant, textural, and overwhelming physical dreamscapes to, of her overactive imagination. So we got two artists happening there. And then the last one that had uh, art, is this is Torrance. This is a continuation of their new, uh, the new art museum that's off of Main Street, which is towards Higgins. This is the Con uh, Conflict Center. Um, this starting today, they will be hosting not only a brand new art exhibit, but uh, make space for Missoula Gives during the biggest fundraising event of the year. Missoula Gives is an initiative of Missoula Community Foundation. is a 26-hour online celebration of Missoula and Ravalli counties. Um, it connects generous Missoulians with the, uh, with the causes they care about. It is the day to celebrate all Missoula is in the role of nonprofits to play in our community great. Um, to making our community great, sorry. During the first Friday event, Missoula Gives will utilize the Confluence Center entrance as a station to facilitate information about the fundraising event and its participating nonprofits. The first Friday Center will feature the exhibit by the group show Torrance, which is a new group of brilliant local artists which Missoula boasts. And so, yeah, um, those are uh, all your art events that are happening in and around the city of Missoula. And as I transition, we're going to talk a little bit more about Missoula Gives. And there's about 10 more hours to give to your local area nonprofits. And as you can see, they are raising money. They are almost at half a million dollars uh, raised for over 180 organizations. And so far, there's 1,800 donors for the city of Missoula to donate to this uh, to these causes and many different things. You can search for a nonprofit. You can learn more about Missoula Gives. You just go to missoulagives.org.
All right, so as we transition from there, we also talked about uh, all the other events that are happening on Friday, not just First Friday. All your art guide stuff is uh, peaking at from 5 to 8 p.m. tonight, every First Friday. There's a bunch of other stuff. Art galleries are open. They so serve hors d'oeuvres, wine, all that kind of stuff. And so um, if you haven't already know that it is also Cinco de Mayo today, and tonight Carriage Park is doing, yes, another brew fest. But it's called On the Rocks Craft Spirit Fest, uh, starting at 4 p.m. Sample all spirits, uh, free of charge, $25 for a commemorative, commemorative cup and three drink tickets. This is about the same time as Will Gibbs is doing their fundraiser for their 26 hours. They'll be wrapping up in about 10 hours from now. So story time and tiny tales at the Missoula Public Library is always every Friday at 10.30 a.m. Missoula Food Bank does their meal distribution at 10 a.m. This is for people who um, are low income or people who are a little bit frugal with their price of uh, produce and they want some uh, nutritious food. Missoula Food Bank helps Missou local area Missoulians and beyond to get some fresh nutritious food at a cheap price. iPhone and iPad basics. So, hey, don't keep asking just random people about how to fix your iPhones, Grandma. iPhones and iPad basics starting at Lifelong Learning Center at 10 a.m. Enjoy the learning them devices as the battery dies after 18 months and cannot hold a charge worth a dang, uh, but this is just a part of the center that offers night classes and have a pay to learn model with certificates in many fields. Uh, preschool play group, this is a uh, play time, a lot of indoor activities at the YMCA, Root Jacker Sports Center, Mismo Gymnastics is back to offer indoor activities for a lot of physical uh, families um, that want to stay active during the winter times. Um, lunch at the Missoula Senior Center, like I always say, it's at 11.30 a.m., the Missoula Center. Five bucks for a lunch, ain't so bad. Yarns and Watercolor at noon at the Missoula Public Library, it's is a continuation which will go on throughout the summer. Um, Hands-on science, aliens and outer space spectrum is uh, Always open from about 11 a.m. to about 6 p.m. Uh, Tuesdays through Saturdays. Lego Club, uh, the second floor of the Missoula Public Library every Friday at 2.30 p.m. They have a bunch of other Lego clubs as well, but today is happening this afternoon. Uh, part of Missoula Gives uh, is going to do some free ice skating at Glacier Ice Rink. You can go to Glacier Ice Rink. You can donate to your favorite hot, uh, nonprofit and get some free ice skating. I'm assuming you do have to uh, pay to rent skates, but it is free ice skating to get into the rink as well. Big Dipper. Be the change. Uh, so if anybody who has donated uh, up to about $20, you can get a free ice cream cone between the hours of 3.30 and 4.30 p.m. at Big Dipper. So there's a lot of benefits happening in town. A lot of organizations are benefiting the Missoula Gives program as well. Big Dipper just happens to be one of them. Transformations is spelled a little bit differently, but this is the third annual early education upcycle Art Show, Missoula Public Library is hosting uh, Clark Fork School Partners, uh, the transformation, the third annual blah, 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 upcycle, blah, blah, blah. Come and support local community collaboration along early education programs while instilling the knowledge uh, and passion of upcycling your fam uh, in your family. You know, please come dressed in your best upcycle or thrifted outfits and accessories to get tickets to uh, enter drawings at Fabulous Raffle Baskets. They'll draw winners at 6.45 p.m. Event starts at 5 p.m. here at the Missoula Public Library. Fix a clinic at the Green Source for uh, for this small electronic specific clinic. Bring a house full of electronic items and learn how to make it like new again instead of tossed in a landfill. This event will be open from 5 to p.m. and it's going to be at Green Source. They provide tools and coaching to help you repair the items you bring in. Reach out to at learn at homeresource.org for more details. Live music is going to happen tonight at Cranky Sam Public House. Um, this is going to be a uh, barn cat. Country band, I wonder what kind of music they're going to play. Ju Juniper Beat, Rat Bath, uh, Eyewitness Piano News. It's going to be at the Instruments Shop. Uh, it's going to be in some indie band music. Roll Dolls, Matilda the Musical. It's going to go on until this weekend. I believe it's going to go on until another weekend as well before the MCT wraps up their community uh, theater program for this season. Canto Esto Cancio. I sing this song. Three, choir, three choirs will be featured at the Denison Center for Cinco de Mayo tonight. Uh, Arno Live VFW special guest Thunder Fox is going to be featuring hip hop at the VFW. Mudslide Charlie is going to be at Union Club tonight at 9 p.m. DJ Suka, DJ Belly Scruggs Cinco de Mayo is going to be some Monks music at 
uh, 9 p.m. tonight. And then we're going to jump right into Saturday. And I've been saying this, I probably said this is like two times already the show, is that the farmer's market is back, baby. 8 a.m. to about 1 p.m. roughly. You guys can enjoy some uh, fresh produce grown by here locally by Missoulians and more. Uh, Montana State Wood Carver Show and Sale. Missoula Fairgrounds is having a, a sale both days, Saturday the 6th and Sunday the 7th. An event so simple they barely need a description. Uh, Big Sky Horse Park Pet Run. Uh, it's the 3, uh, 3K and 6K at the Big Sky Horse Park starting at 9 a.m. on Saturday. B uh, free Comic Book Day at Muse Comics at 10 a.m. The Prairie Sisters Vintage Market is going to be at the Historic Fort Missoula starting at 10 a.m. Shop the best vintage handmade vendors in the area. Enjoy delicious food vendors. Uh, uh, find the perfect vintage or handmade item uh, for your home and support local business owners. Garden City Brew Fest. Yes, we're having two brew fests this weekend. Friday at 4 p.m. and then Garden City Brew Fest is starting at noon. Uh, you probably heard on the radio, it is the, the very first, this is the original brew fest. Brew gardens and special cups on an annual event to bring this, uh, bring this brew to Karis Park. Um, while you drop off your kids at MCAT Saturday drop-ins from 1 to 3 p.m., you can go to the brew fest. MCAT Saturday drop-ins are great for kids who want to learn stop animation, some video editing along that way. And work in an open shop, kind of like, like an open workshop for kids age 8 to uh, 14. Uh, Makerspace. Um, this is a, a place where you can do uh, all sorts of uh, 3D printing and more. Is doing a sewing and mending on, at the library on the first floor. Um, it's starting at 2.30 p.m. And then we're going to jump way ahead until this, this evening and talk about some dueling pianos with the dueling Missoulians at Stave and Hoop, 8 p.m. Solid Snake Karaoke at West Lane's Fun Center at 9 p.m. Union Club is going to do Idle Ranch Hands. Um, then we got DJ Chris Moon at the Battle Center every Saturday at 10 p.m. So there's a lot of stuff happening this weekend as well. Um, I do have a little bit of time. I might want to refer to MissoulaEvents.net for your information on how you can learn more. So if you go to MissoulaEvents.net, you can see this page. You can see all the events that are happening. There's definitely a lot of events. I'm going to Saturday, People's Markets, Story Time. You know, hurling, here's another one as well. It looks like I missed this one. I must have posted a little bit later. If you're interested in doing so, uh, watching some hurling in the city of Missoula, they're doing a hurling. Uh, the McIrdenary Cup. Ugh, I'm terrible with names. I'm just reading this now. Uh, hurling will begin on the Western Montana track Saturday, May 6th at the Washington Grizzly Stadium. This is the uh, 10, uh, 1230 meet of the Montana uh, Shamrockers of the Jewel of the blah, 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 uh, Darnard Keefe. And a full afternoon of hurling will come in in the championship match about 5 p.m., uh, then you can stop by Charlie B's to uh, hang out with the, the players of Hurling. So there's definitely a lot going on in the city of Missoula this weekend that even uh, I missed for sure. So let's see, is there anything happening on Sunday? Usually there's not too much happening on Sunday. Um, you know, Clay Studio is doing the Clay for All Bowls, teaching people about making bowls at the Clay Studio of Missoula. They're doing that plant swap at Western Sire. That's a one that you can probably go check out if you have a plant. You can do some plant swaps. MCTs is doing their uh, um, uh, Matilda the Musical as well. And then there's going to be a pre-Mother's Day pamper and a picnic at the Nine Mile Schoolhouse. So Mother's Day is coming up. And then there's going to be a Mother's Day uh, pop-up sale, a pre-Mother's Day at the Cranky Sand Public House on Sunday. Mommy and Me uh, Tea at Hearts of Fire uh, Pottery and Art Studio Pinball Tournament at the Odd Pitch Brewing Company, Sundays at 4 p.m. Uh, let's see, uh, we got uh, some bands. There's going to be Claude Bourbon at Longstaff House, Acoustic Music. Uh, Rio Speedwagon, 7.30 p.m. on Sunday at the University of Montana. Some rock music, rocking karaoke at the Sunrise Saloon. And that's pretty much it that I'm going to be talking about to you guys as well. I want to thank you guys for joining me this morning. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend.